Are they all in yet? I think you can go ahead, Ruth. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending our class on Firewise Landscaping presented by UC Master Gardeners of El Dorado County. Our mission is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices to the, com to the community. Our class is being presented by UC Master Gardener, Alice Cantalo, and your hosts are Pam Lane, Ruth Haynes, and Tracy Cielo. This presentation will be about an hour and a half long. We appreciate and encourage questions and we'll do our best to address all of them at the end of the participation presentation through chat. Since we have quite a number of participants today, we have muted everyone and turned video off except the presenters. One last thing, this class will, will be posted to our public web website after the class. We will post links for our website in the chat. Okay then, let's get going. Alice Canelo has been a master gardener since 2012 and has taught our Firewise Landscape class in partnership with Mark and Robin Stanley. Alice chairs the Defensible Space and Hardening Home for her Fire Safe Council. And she also leads the Master Gardener Native Plant Garden at the Sherwood Demonstration Garden. So before I turn the class over to Alice, you will need a piece of paper and a pencil for a class activity. I'll turn the class over to Alice. Great, thank you, Ruth. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming here on an absolutely gorgeous Saturday morning. Um, we are going to talk about something really important, and you obviously believe that's important too, which is creating and maintaining a firewise landscape. And I would like to give a special thanks to Robin and Mark Stanley. I started um, joining them back in 2014, actually, with I would teach one part of this class, and a lot of these slides are from them, and they've done an incredible job in the community bringing the message of firewise landscaping to many people. Um, today, Robin is recovering from surgery, so she's not able to be with us, but... Um, I just wanted to give a special thanks to them for all they've done in the past on this topic. So why do you care? Obviously you care that you're here. We all are probably very aware of the county ordinance. Um, it actually has been state law to have 100 feet of dispensable sp a defensible space for quite some time, but it is now a county ordinance and so it's more on people's radar now. But it's more than that. All, your house and your property, they're major investments, aren't they? Do you think about it? And it might even affect your homeowner's insurance, although we'd like to think it would do a better job of that. I think some of us are frustrated that we've done a lot of work and that hasn't affected our insurance. But also you can rebuild a house, but can you recreate a home? I think we've seen from some of the big fires that have happened in the last several years, just how devastating a uh, wildfire can be. It does happen here. We've had the Angora fire up in South Lake Tahoe. We've had the King fire. We've had the Sand fire. All three of those were, um, I guess that 2007, 2014 and 2014. So it's not that we're immune over here on the foothills either. Today, the topics I'm gonna to talk about are basic fire science and wildfire behavior. We're then gonna be spending quite a bit of time, of course, on landscaping for fire resistance and defensible space in particular. Look at a few nuts and bolts, like the seasonality of that and um, some pruning things. Gonna look at some examples of before and after with some homes. And then we're gonna fine tune for your specific property. And then we're gonna look at future wildlife trends, wildfire trends, excuse me. And one thing I wanted to mention um, about questions that I forgot. Um, if you're putting questions in the chat, that's fine. But I would encourage you to make sure that the topic is obvious. Like don't put something in there. Um, like, I don't quite understand that. Make sure it's clear what it is you don't understand so that by the end of the talk, we know what the questions actually go to. And I'm willing to stay here as long as necessary to make sure that every question is answered. So we're looking here as, as a standard map, the fire hazard severity zone map. And this is, they've done this for the whole of California. And as you can see in the populated areas between El Dorado Hills and Platt Pollock Pines which is where most of us live. Um, we are basically, all in a fire hazard area. Some of it's moderate, some of it's high, and some of it's extreme, but it's all considered fire hazard area. 
And if you look at those wide area, white areas and think, oh, it's okay, I live in a white area. No, those are just areas that they're not mapping because they're either federal or they're a community. So really basically our whole county is a hazard area. And before you get too excited, if you live in El Dorado Hills and think, oh, um, it's okay, I'm not in a high hazard area as Pollock Pines, these maps can be different. This is one that Cal Poly created from Cal Fire data and here's El Dorado County. And in this particular map, which is of El Dorado County, uh, excuse me, which is a wildfire threat, which includes ember exposure, um, you can see El Dorado Hills is down here in the extreme part of it, and um, Paul Pines is in less than El Dorado Hills. So depending on which model you look at, um, basically the entire county, we all need to really worry about this. And I was going to do a poll, and I think I forgot to do that. Let's see. So yes, here we go. Thank you. So if you can tell me where you live, whether it's a subdivision or a town or rural more than one acre, it'll help me understand better who it is that I'm talking to when I um, talk today. And also, if you are on one or more acres, or even if you're not, which describes the wildlife near your home. And so I'm gonna to go to the next slide on that. Oh, not quite yet. Okay, so it's looking like we have a lot of people in the oak conifer woodlands, a few people up higher in the conifer forest and some people in the straight oak woodland. Okay, that's great. That helps me. And we have some people in subdivision and towns, about 25%, and then other people are in rural. And I'm really glad that the people in the subdivision town are here also because sometimes we forget and we think, oh, it's just those people out in property that need to worry about, but of course it's all of us. Okay, this is great. And thank you very much. Let's see how many people in Chaparral. Nobody really in Chaparral or the lower areas. So it's mostly, um, looks like from about rescue and on up. Okay, thank you everybody. So in California in 2020, 2020, as you all know, was a huge wildfire year. We had 9,600 wildfires. Um, there actually are years with more, but we forget most of those are put out and are kept to about 10 acres or less. But a small percentage do get gigantic and those are the ones, of course, we hear about. Those are the Angora fires, the King of Fires, the Camp Fire, the Tubbs Fire, and I could go on. And so with our houses, we wanna protect them for all those small fires. But we also wanna protect them if we possibly can from those mega fires like Camp Fire. And it used to be thought that, oh, you can't do anything about those, but um, we actually can. A lot of the things that we can do and talk about today will protect us also partly from the mega fire. This was showing you the various types of um, wildland. So I, I did that just a little too soon on the poll, that's okay. So we are gonna be mostly talking today about the oak woodland, the mixed conifer and the conifer forest because it sounds like that's where most of you live. So how exactly does something like a house catch on fire? And that's really the key is how it catches on fire because once it catches on fire, then something like 90 to 93% of the houses are completely destroyed. And so that's the key is you don't want to catch on fire. And what do you need? You need heat, you need fuel, and you need oxygen. And that oxygen we can kind of think of as air. So the, if you think about a nice little campfire you know, that you've made, the heat is the match. The fuel is some small fuel that catches the larger fuel on fire. Because if you took a match and stuck it right underneath a log, of course the log wouldn't catch on fire probably. You need that small fuel. And then lastly, you've got air, which is why they built these, these logs like that with lots of air. I mean, we all know these things, this is pretty obvious, but if we keep that in mind as we're thinking about wildfire in our homes, it can be very helpful. In fact, our houses aren't that different from that campfire. We have fuel, we've got all this incredibly dry two by fours and two by sixes and stuff inside. We've, if we have small fuel that can catch that larger fuel on fire, which we'll be talking about later, then we get a major fire. The oxygen, the air, we've got air outside, we've got air inside, it's perfect setup, just like that campfire was. And for the heat, let's look at the different sources of the heat. People usually think about a wall of flames is coming and that certainly can be a, a source of heat. But it turns out that that's not really always the main one. There's also radiant heat, which is really important. If you have a fire um, and say at one house like this, the heat from that fire is so hot that it can start the other houses next to it on fire. The same way a bush right next to your house uh, can do the same thing. So radiant heat is an important uh, source of that heat to start a fire on your house. But it turns out that probably the most important one are embers. 
And they can be big like these, which are kind of called firebrands. If you can imagine those glowing and hitting your house, you know, that they could start your house on fire. But they're also often really small and just lots and lots of them bombarding your house. And those embers they're finding, and this is what especially, you know, in the last several years they found those embers can be really important to um, starting a fire. And so knowing this can help us as we try to protect our house. This is a kind of interesting uh, picture, kind of sta standard of Angora fire up at South Lake Tahoe. If you look at that house that is burned down, like I say, this wasn't one of the big fires, the Angora, I think over 200 houses burned down in that fire. Um, the bushes in front, the trees, even the big trees in back, none of those caught fire, but the house did. And that's because of embers. They came right over all of that, came right onto the house. And that's what caused the house to, uh, to burn up. And these windblown embers they're finding can come from as far away as a mile. You know, um, first they thought, oh, maybe a third of a mile to a half mile. They realized they could come from a mile, even more. So that's why people who are in subdivisions can, might be at, at risk. They don't even realize it. It can be from a fire that's a half a mile away. So what about the fuel? We've talked about the heat. The fuel is anything that'll burn. Well, yeah, obviously, but if you think about that, that's just about everything except for rock or concrete or maybe metal. So it's dry or dead vegetation, the wood siding, it's your roofing, it's your decking, your wood furniture, your broom that's sitting on your deck, your recycling bin, your trees, your shrubs, yes, especially if they're woody, and even perennials. So it's pretty much, you know, anything we have around our houses. So how is it best to protect our house? Well, fortunately, there have been a lot of studies done. And especially as we keep getting these bigger and bigger fires, we keep toning, um, honing in our knowledge more and more on what it is that really matters. And so they've done studies of houses that survived versus ones that didn't. I forget which fire this is. I think this is actually the camp fire I took from Google Earth. And we have data before the fire because of all the defensible space inspections. And we have data after the fire because after a fire happens, Cal Fire goes in and does what's called damage inspections. And so they, they survey, they try to figure out, you know, what each house, uh, why they burn. Now, this was quite a job for the campfire when there were almost 19,000 homes that burned. But so people, researchers have been taking that data and looking at it and trying to figure out well, what can help houses survive. And some of the main researchers in that are Jack Cohen. He's been studying this stuff for actually over 45 years. Sifford and Keeley had a really good study in 2019 that looked at four different California regions, including the North Central, which would cover us. Then there was Austin Troy, which was the University of Colorado. He also did a 2020 study actually of um, the campfire. I listened to a webinar last February, but he hasn't actually published his data yet. But there's another approach um, besides looking at survived and burnt up houses, and that's people actually do experiments. And this is one that's this has been going on for a while too. And this is the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. They have an amazing facility in, I think it's South Carolina, but it might be North Carolina. Um, and they, like here, they built this house and then they bombard it with embers. In this particular case, they had two different kinds of house, one kind on one side, one on the other, and then they can kind of look and see what happens. So between these, um, oh, for that, I'd like to shout out to Steve Quarles, who's been looking at building and wild, buildings and wildfire for also 30 plus years, first with UC, then with IBHS, then later again, I think with UCCE, and I think, excuse me, the Cooperative Extension for uh, University of California. And I think at this point he's retired now, but he still does webinars and he's very active. Also, Jana Valachovic uh, with UCNR, who's the forest advisor up in Humboldt Del, Del Norte County. She's written a lot of stuff. And I just found out yesterday that they're actually in the process of revising some of this information as we speak, which is almost ready to be uh, released again. So again, people are constantly learning more about how to help protect houses. The point is we don't need to be sitting ducks. Um, there are things we can do. And that of course is why we're all here. So it's kind of a three prong approach. If you think about for your house, you wanna protect it. So the first thing is to harden your home. And what they're finding now is that that is really important. And a lot of these studies, especially for the ones looking at you know, damage versus um, surviving homes, they're finding that really hardening the home against wildfire is probably the best thing a person can do. 
And that's because of those embers coming, they might hit pine needles on the roof and start the fire. So you wanna make sure the pine needles are off and you wanna make sure you have a class A roof. It might hit a, a bush over here. So you wanna make sure that you don't have a bush right there. It, you might, um, you know, the siding might be really flammable and old. And so that's a problem. So this whole thing about hardening your house, but I'm not really gonna talk about that today because that's not our topic. But I want to tell you that um, this is a wonderful we uh, resource you can go to which is from UCNR. And I think this is part of the stuff that they are in the process of revising. But they, they feel that the highest priority is the roof and the vents, then the decks, the windows. Fourth priority, I can't see. <laughs> they are the eaves. And the fifth priority um, would be the siding. And lots of times people feel like, oh, it's gonna be so expensive if I have to go in and change all my siding. That's actually the, last priority for almost all the studies. Some of the priority, other priorities vary around, but roofs are always first and siding is always pretty much last. But um, eaves kind of moves around. Sometimes people think it's more important. Because again, no one knows for sure. We're just, some of these studies are just kind of getting going. And it's not an easy thing to figure out. So along though with those things, oh, here, let's, let's look real quick at, here's a, a house which is been retrofitted. Um, they put on stucco siding. You can also put on, um, a hardy board or fiber cement siding, but they've got softened ease, the double pane windows and their roof. But again, um, you don't necessarily have to do all those expensive things. And that's why it's a good idea to read some of the, um, some of that document. And also there's an excellent YouTube, which we may get time for at the end today, but if not, it's in the resources at the end. I highly recommend that you listen to it. Okay, so also up, there, up in the first priority though is vegetation. So as, as important as hardening your home is, so is defensible space and fire resistant landscaping. So that's the second prong of our approach to trying to protect our homes. And I'm gonna be talking about that for uh, most of the time. So right now let's quick look at the third one too. I'm not gonna talk too much about it. And that's the fact that the access road is a third important prong. So you need to harden your home if you can, defensible space for sure, and wide access if you can. So let's just look at that real quickly before we get back to defensible space. So imagine that you see a road like this and many of us would look at that and think, oh, what a nice quaint country road. But if you're Mark Stanley, who early in his career, I think was a captain on a fire truck, then um, you are in charge of a number of people's life in your truck and you come to a road like this and what do you do? You look at this road and you say to yourself, narrow, overhanging trees, is there a way out? I can't even see if there's a house there. Are my people safe? Is my crew safe? Do I wanna go down that road? No, it's kind of like being a triage person when you're a uh, captain of a fire truck. And I haven't been, but Mark <laughs> has and that's what he says. And that, you know, if you come to a home like this, you're probably not gonna go down there in a big fire. You're gonna go to one where they've worked a little bit and they've obviously cared enough about their road to try to make it so that fire trucks can get in and that he's not putting his crew at risk. So some people have gotten together in groups and they've, you know, maybe they can't make their road as wide as, as they would like to, but they can take some of the vegetation off on the side. And if it's steep like this, hopefully there's a place on the other place on the other side where they can make a spot for cars to turn off. And here's a road where people have done that. Actually, this is Sky Ridge Road. And um, look what a great job someone has done at keeping that road cleared. This is the same road, a different part. Again, the road itself is not all that wide, but at least there's room on the two sides for cars to go and sit if a fire truck has to go by or vice versa. So those are the two important prongs and, but now we're gonna focus on the third one, which is the defensive space, the fire resistant landscaping, because that's what we're here to talk about today. But I just wanna make sure you understood the other two are equally important, if, if not more so for the hardening homes. Okay, so for our defensible space, we kind of have a, a number of goals. One thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure that any wall of flame that does come doesn't go from, from plant to plant to plant right up to our house. Another thing we want to do is we want to reduce the chance that the house itself will catch on fire from those embers. And then the third thing we want to do is provide a safe place for fire personnel to work. And they did find for sure in the campfire, especially that, you know, if you can have anyone protecting your house, it's a much, much better chance of survival. Unfortunately, in the really huge fires, people are, uh, the firefighters are mostly just trying to get people out safely. But for the smaller fires, that can make a huge difference. So all, all of these things are our goals with defensible space. 
So to do this, we kind of think of our house as having three zones. There's the first zone that's five feet. And you can find these various diagrams. And up until a few years ago, they didn't include that first zone. But now they're finding how important it is. There's even a state law now, AB 3074, I think it is, that talks about how important that first, first zone is. And so more and more of the diagrams are being revised to include three zones. That first five foot zone they call zone zero. The next one we'll talk about is zone, zone one and then zone two. But let's first look at that very first zone. Um, here's another um, one that's been revised so that you can see that it's the first five feet, then the next 30 feet, and the next 100 feet. You can see how you get progressively and progressively more um, aggressive as you go away from the house, excuse me, towards the house. In fact, that is the key. Often when you hear, oh, 100 feet, 100 feet of defensible space, so you go out and you start looking at 100 feet. No, you want to do it the other way around. You want to start at the house. It turns out the house is the most important part, and then slowly work out from there going out to your 100 feet. And how do you measure? You measure from the house, of course, but also if you have a deck, you measure from the deck out 30 feet and then 100 feet, and then you know the five feet also from the deck. Um, if you had a little building that was super close, you would include it in that, in that footprint and you would measure out from there. So that zone zero, what an important zone. That first five feet around your house, it turns out is the most critical. You don't want anything combustible there. And this is a hard thing for all of us to adjust to because we're used to putting foundation plants and such at our house. And to think of that first zone as not having any, anything combustible is tough, but it turns out it's really important. So that includes pine needles. That's within your first five feet, right? You don't want those dry pine needles up there. I think we all know that, but it's really critical. Let's take a look at this house. Think about all the things that they have that are flammable within the first five feet. Just look yourself and see what you see. And here we go. So there's the wooden chair right there. There are these plants right in front of a window and plants right in front of a window are the worst because when you get that heat right in front of a window, it can burst the window actually as you get these differential um, heat going on inside of the window. You've got this plant that's going right up the wooden post. Got lots and lots of plants here in the first five feet. You have this one that's overhanging the house. So this is a house that has a lot of combustible stuff within five feet. And again, don't forget, it's not just right next to the walls of the house, it's also next to the decks, um, next to the railings, next to the porches, all that within the first five feet here also. What about mulch? Um, you know, mulch is a great thing for gardeners usually. It keeps moisture in, um, it, it's something we really, it keeps the weeds down, but you don't necessarily want it within five feet of your house because mulch burns. And if it doesn't burn, it first smolders and then burns. And they did studies where they looked at different characteristics of different kinds of um, mulch. This, this was up in Tahoe. And these one circled ones kind of show you how different they can be. Here we have pine needles are particularly bad compared to combust composted wood chips, which are you know, much better. But even composted wood chips, all of these burn. You know? So none of them should be within five feet of your house. Another study, this one was done in Arizona. They even included sod in theirs and compost. And again, you know, with, with a wall of flame, which is what their torch was Im imitating, everything burned except for decomposed granite. So here's kind of an example of what can happen. This is back in that um, experimental place I talked about in the Carolinas. So they built these two sides of the house differently. The one on the right hand side is completely hardened. It has rock mulch um, and the, the deck is, you know, salt kind of solid. Over on the left side, the ha house is not hardened. Uh, it even has shingle siding, I think. It has mulch right up to the, to the wall. And I think there was even a small bush there. And you can see what happened after 10 minutes. This side had the same ember storm, but nothing, nothing combusted at all, nothing um, ignited. On this side, after the same 10 minutes of the em same ember storm, it was the mulch actually that started the bottom of the wall and then it started to creep up the wall and you see how then the heat was enough that it even went inside of the attic and they ended up putting this fire out, but it would have uh, burnt that whole house down. So let's look at some of the things that you can put within five feet. Rock mulch, rock walks, brick. This is just a different paradigm than what we're used to. You know, we're used to this kind of thing. Oh, there's a wall, let's put a plant next to it. And so even though they've done a nice job here, 
And clearly they, they've got a problem here because they've got a plant right on the wood here and here and here. And that's if this catches fire then from those, it will bring the fire right to the house. So I think I've hit that hard enough then that zone zero, let's move on now to zone one, which is the five feet out from there, which is five feet to 30 feet. And the standard thing as we say is that it needs to be lean, clean and green. What exactly does that mean? The lean, it needs to have well-spaced vegetation and only small amounts of flammable vegetation. It needs to be clean with no accumulation of dead stuff or other uh, debris that's flammable. And the plants need to be nice and healthy and green. So to get there, to be lean, clean and green, well, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna remove anything that's dead and dying. So obviously the pine needles and the pine cones need, need to be taken out of there. The next thing we're gonna to do to try to get it there is we're gonna break up continuous vegetation. So you don't have to take everything out, but you want islands. You want islands of a shrub and maybe a tree as long as they're away from each other, both horizontally and vertically. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. You can have a ground fire, in other words, like this, and if it can come right up to a tree and not burn it if you don't have fuel there. This fire, as you can see, is actually being lit by this person as a prescribed burn, and we'll be talking about that later. But so surface fires, you know, they don't necessarily jump up on their own unless there's something there to take them up, like this. You can see all these small, smaller ones next to a bigger tree, which then when they caught on fire, it just took it right up into the tree. The standard kind of clearance that um, CAL FIRE puts out, and this is on the back of the um, evaluation form for the county inspections, actually. They say that bushes need to be two times their height away from each other and trees about 10 feet. I can't actually find any uh, data that supports this necessarily, but this is kind of the standard rule of thumb. Of course, it depends on what these bushes are like. If this is a very dense bush that's flammable, two times might not be quite enough. If it's a very open bush, and it's maybe even one that's well watered or naturally holds moisture, then maybe it doesn't even need to be quite that far, but it's just kind of a rule of thumb to be thinking of. This is all, of course, on a flat slope. If it's a steep slope, um, then you can have this kind of thing happen. And so theoretically, this tree and this tree aren't necessarily all that far apart horizontally, but, um, and look what's happened though with the fire, excuse me, they are far apart horizontally, but look what's happened to the fire as it goes from one up the, to the other on a hill. So if you're on a steep hill, that two times isn't enough, it might be even more like four or six times from each other. So what you wanna do in that zone is you wanna cut out any dead wood. Of course, you wouldn't leave it there. They're, this is in the process, they're gonna take that wood out, but you can thin shrubs to make them um, better. Just in general, you're reducing the fuel. It would be better if they weren't touching, of course. For the shrubs that you've left after thinning, uh, maybe you know, you've now made some nice gaps. If any that are maybe four feet or taller, you can create umbrellas where you wanna take out maybe half of the lower branches and then you can actually come along here and, and shorten these other branches here also. For non wetty ve vegetation, which would be things like um, you know, flowers and stuff, you wanna keep them to about 12 inches high. And when we talk about that, it doesn't have to be an individual shrub or an individual plant that's completely by itself from every other plant. Um, that would look like, I don't know, prison or solitary confinement. It can be little, but, uh, little batches of bushes, little batches of plants like this. Um, ideally, you'd stay within about 10 by 10 foot for these little patches, but it doesn't have to be just one plant by itself. Here's another example. These are some natives where it's a little patch, that, but this patch needs to be separated from the other patches. And don't forget that this is not just for, you know, some people think, oh, defensible space, that's for all that wild land outside of my property. No, it's for ornamentals too, and it's for your property. And when things are too close, you still need to separate them. Here's an example of a house in the foothills. Um, actually, this is my house. <laughs> and when we bought this house, it had plants all along the wall here. Um, we took those out. They were all very flammable. We later had a, a lilac here, which we actually moved. It was very difficult psychologically to do, and it took us a couple of years to finally get rid of everything within that first five feet. Um, and now we have done it around the entire house. But then you see here too, is you have the well-spaced vegetation out here where we have patches over here of bushes 
pastures here, you can't tell there's actually a little stream in between here and here, a dry stream. So those uh, hardscape can be a really good fuel break. You don't need to water it and it can be great for, for separating those patches. Um, here's just a couple of other examples, you know, benches, what it can look like. This is a really nice one. You can also put swales into your landscape because what that does is it helps collect all of the rainwater. And then as that rainwater stays right there on site, it actually helps the plants stay moist longer into summer, which is also really nice for um, your defensible space. Rocks are great. They can look really pretty too. And of course, little low flowers. Yes, they will burn, but they're much less flammable. And so, and they stay low, which is great. And here they are separated from others. Just to kind of give you an ex example of what you can do in that five to 30 foot zone. We've been talking mostly about horizontal clearance, but don't forget the vertical clearance too. So any shrub, uh, think of it that it could be three times high. Actually, I got another three times the, the flames. And so you, if it is underneath another tree, just make sure that it's, it's low enough that it's not gonna send fire up into those branches because otherwise you'll get what's happening on the left there. So here's kind of a nice example too. We're gonna to look at a quick before and after. Um, here we have a number of madrones and someone came in and they did this, which is definitely an approach you can take. Um, another thing I, I probably would have done a little differently and that's why this is kind of an art. There's not one way to do things. Um, I would have taken out some of these more spindly ones, including even this one and left this, this, and this. Um, I would have left some patches of some of that undergrowth, but further away from the tree. I don't know what it is, but especially if it was a native, I probably would have left it there a little bit. Okay. And can someone tell me, are you seeing the arrow when I do this? I can see your cursor, yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's another example of that where someone has um, managed, well, this is actually looks like a little orchard, but we have some um, trees here, they're separated from other. What I wanted to point out here is you do have to be careful because if you disturb the soil while you're doing some of this defensible space, you can end up with invasive weeds and they can be really tall and really fire prone. So it's kind of a, a, a special thing because if you don't want a lot of mulch and you don't want a lot of weeds, you know, how you deal with that, um, can be, can be tricky, but you really have to watch that. And part of it can be weed eating at the exact right time. We have a great pest note on star thistle in particular on if you can systematically weed it at the correct time before it sets seed, you can um, start to get rid of this kind of thing. So we talked about removing the dead and dying wood. We talked about breaking up continuous vegetation, both up and down. Another big one is limbing up large trees. You don't have to remove them just because they're in your defensible space. You can have large trees, but you know, especially if they're not really close to each other. But the limbing up, you want to have at least six feet underneath them if you can, or if it's um, a little tree, you know, not more than about the first third you might take out. And then as it grows, you might take out more and more. You can do that with just a pole saw. These pole saws you can even get that have motors on the end of them, or you can rent those. And some trees like um, ponderosa and sugar pine kind of trim themselves. I don't know if you've ever had those, but they'll often drop their branches on their own. But things like cedar and um, uh, Douglas fir definitely need to be limbed up and ornamental ones. So just, just and even though it says six feet, if you can go higher, that's not a bad thing if, it, if the tree is nice and tall and can handle it. Here's a very tall tree that is completely limbed up and, and relatively close to this house. But I actually specifically asked even Stephen Quarles, who's been studying this stuff for so long, about large trees near houses. And he said he didn't feel that it was a major problem. If you can limb them up, of course. Now, one thing that happens is this tree, even though it's limbed up, you want those branches to be at least 10 feet from the roof. They are going to still drop pine needles onto this house. And so when you have something like that, you, you have to just be a little more careful. Again, people think that they need to take down their nice big trees because it's a fire hazard or really look at the real fire hazard for this house. It's all over here. These are some oaks that are well over 100 years old, again, at our house. And once again, because they're close to the house, um, they're, you know, they're at least 10 feet away here, but they do drop leaves and also little branches that we have to be careful about getting off. For us, it's worth it. Just to give you a visual of what can happen with tree trunks during fires. Um, these I think are conifers and you can see they don't really, 
this one back here is going up, I think, because there is some smaller vegetation. If you can keep these large trees without any vegetation under them, though, they don't burn. And these are some oak trees in the ember storm doing the same thing, where you can see it's not like they're setting out tons of radiant heat or flames. That's just a little bit of the bark that's burning. So the El Dorado County is, has already started these inspections. They started some of their defensible space inspections last year. And in 2020, at, at this one presentation to the Board of Supervisors, we learned that there are 367 were done last year, mostly in Pollock Pines and Garden Valley. And right from the get-go at the first visit, a, a little over 10% of those were compliant. And after several visits, the others became in compliance. So last year was mostly just an educational year. This year, they're going to be focusing, I think it's on the Hanks Exchange area and Deer Valley, something like that. But so these inspections are coming and they give people um, a sheet of paper and, and they're, it's not like, bam, you know, you, you lose. They um, work with you and over several visits, try to make it so that it's more in compliant. And, you know, later we asked um, about what was seen as a common problem for all those ones that weren't in compliance. And what John Wilcox said was, it's the trees not being limbed up kind of stood out to him. That um, a lot of people will think that, oh, there's a big tree, I need to do something about it. So that's really expensive and I really like that tree, I don't wanna take it down so instead of, so they don't do anything. Whereas really all they need to do is limb up the tree and it'll be fine. So what do you do with all that slash? Um, it can be tricky. <laughs> because that's obviously flammable too. You take it out of the tree and now you put it on the ground in these big piles, that's a, a fire hazard also. A lot of people just naturally say, oh, okay, I'll burn it. And you can, you do need a permit and you can only do it on burn days. And if you do decide to do that, it's definitely best to do it on a dry day right before rain if you can, assuming that that's a burn day because then you'll burn it up the best, have fewer carbon emissions and less smoke. But there are alternatives and the El Dorado County website actually has a really nice page on alternatives to burning. Uh, one of those is chipping programs where you can take that wood and get it chipped up into little chips that then can be used um, in various places for wood mulch. Not close to your house, of course, but a little further out. Um, unfortunately, those, we have this great program where those were free through the El Dorado Sa Fire Safe Council had gotten some grants and those grants have ended. And I don't think there are any in the pipeline right now. So, but you can also hire a company to do chipping. My dad, I know bought one of those little chippers you can buy and it was not very successful because the size of the wood that would go into it was so, it was so small that it was not useful. But there are ones you can rent that are bigger. But I think, you know, if it were I, uh, you can definitely consider just hiring someone to one of the really big chippers to do that. There's also green waste disposal and distance piles. I'll talk about those in a second. Um, and then also uh, community cleanup days though, watch for those or organize one yourself where uh, El Dorado disposal comes out and maybe puts a big dumpster out there that people can put stuff into. So let's look at green, green waste disposal. It's kind of amazing what El, El Dorado disposal has available for free. I mean, you can have these two giant bins of 96 gallons every two weeks. You can even add another two to five bags. There are 32 gallons. I guess you buy big, big paper bags like that. You have to arrange ahead of time for that though. You also get these unlimited green waste days and, and still these vouchers you know you can use with curbside. So take advantage of those. It, it's easy to get to March and say, oh dang, I didn't use that. But yeah, use those vouchers if you need to get rid of a lot of green waste. Another thing you can do and that we have started doing here more are distanced piles. You don't want giant piles, but you can have small piles as long as they're away from each other. I would do this away from the 100 feet. I wouldn't do it within 100 feet of my house, of course. But um, this one in the middle, if you can see this middle pile, that was one we put there about two years ago. And um, these other ones are, are, are newer. It doesn't take long for them to start to just kind of settle into the soil, which is a, a nice way to enhance the soil also. So the one last thing I want to talk about in that five foot to three foot zone is mulch. So you can have mulch. It, you know, that composted wood chip is the best, is the safest, but any mulch you use, it needs to be less than three inches deep and kind of in patches away from each other. You don't want to have this massive mulched zone in that first 30 feet. And again, mulch can be good for keeping down weeds though. So here we have rational action where someone really did some nice work in their um, first 30 feet and further out. Here we have overreaction. <laughs> so don't feel like you have to do this because to be honest, this house is not very safe 
because those embers are going to come right in here anyway and bombard it like crazy. It looked like we even have some plants right there next to the house. So um, there's nothing stopping those embers. There's just some preliminary research that shows that some trees can actually help a house in stopping some of the embers before they get there, but it's kind of preliminary. It's not real um, solid yet. So anyway, you, you don't need to do this, but you do need to maintain it. You've gone to all that effort and it's wonderful. That doesn't mean, wow, I'm done. I can walk away. No, you have to maintain. And this is really important. So every year, you know, maybe at first, even twice a year, you need to get out there and reevaluate and look, oh, look, this is grown there. Oh, look, this is dead. And you need to just keep it up. It's much easier after the first big go. It's kind of like condoing if any of you are condoers, but you know, the first cleaning all out is a big deal. And then after that, you do need to maintain it. So we've talked about the first five feet. We've talked about the next 30 feet. Let's go to this next zone to the end of what the county requires and the state is 100 feet. So let's look at the 30 to 100 foot zone now. And as you can see in this diagram, now we're starting to get more bushes, more trees. We're still clearer than out here in the wildland, but it's not as, as clear as that first 30 feet. So it's a little more relaxed. You wanna do all the same things you did in the first 30 feet, but now you can keep more of the leaf and the pine needles, the litter even, so as long as it's under three inches deep. And in my experience, my pine needles and leaves that collect never get deeper than three inches because they, the, the rate at which they go into the soil is about the same as which they're falling from the trees. But you do want, need to watch that, make sure it's not deeper than about three inches. Still, you're going to be breaking up all that vegetation with spacing, but now it can be a little bit closer. You can have a little bit more patches. You, you still for sure want to avoid ladder fuels, though, up into any trees. And you really want to watch those dead and dry summer grasses and make sure they stay down to a three to four inch high maximum. And maintain. Can't emphasize that enough, how important it is to maintain. There are some special considerations. Um, a wood pile or outbuildings and propane tanks. Um, make sure that those are at least 30 feet out. And some of the new stuff coming out from UCNR, I think is gonna say 25 feet out. So sometime, somewhere between 25 and 30 feet out. And then you want nice mineral soil in all directions. I think this is one thing to actually look at on the defensible space inspection that the counties are doing. If you have a deck, it's, it's a little, um, you know, there's a little risk there and you want to make sure there's no vegetation below it or touching it. It's really important. And I would look at the hardening home stuff from the UCNR to see some ideas they have for making your deck safer. And the other thing is you want to protect riparian areas. If you do have an actual stream, whether it's intermittent or uh, permanent on your property, it's going to have some special plants that are along that. You don't necessarily want to clear those out. Really um, respect those riparian plants. We, we've lost something like 95% of riparian and wetland areas in the state, and they tend to be um, relatively moist and not particularly fire prone. And so do consider protecting your riparian areas. What about wildflowers? You know, California used to be just covered in native wildfires, flowers, excuse me. Um, and what happened to so many of them? Uh, well, weed eating is not very good for wildflowers, for one thing. And so think about that. If, if you're out there in the spring and you like the flowers, then as you're weed eating and you see some poppies or some maybe native bulbs or something else, weed eat around them. Let them grow long enough to flower, to go to seed. And then after they've gone to seed, then with a string trimmer, you can, you can cut down those couple of patches. If you do that, you might be surprised to find that some wildfires come back into your property. But if you just, as a general rule, just go and weed it everything down to three inches in huge areas, you know, you'll never have wildfires at your house. So how about past the 100 feet? If 100 feet is good, then 200 feet and 300 feet is better, right? No. They almost all the studies, lots of studies actually are showing that beyond the 100 feet, it just really doesn't make a difference. Maybe even beyond about 60 feet, but we're not gonna go there. So, cause we're, we're required to go out to 100 feet. Now, if you're on a steep slope, that might be different. You know, maybe 200 feet would, would work, but there are some studies that are showing even on steep slope, 100 feet is all you need. So you don't have to do this forever, just to your 100 feet. What you want beyond the 100 feet is you want resilience, you want habitat health, you want you know, a healthy woodland or forest out there. And so this, this area out here is fine. And this one's probably a little too close to the house here. They may need to do something there, I suppose. 
But what's happening out here is not really relevant to the susceptibility of this house to catching on fire. So is this a healthy forest? No, <laughs> that's way too dense. Um, how about this? That's not really a particularly healthy forest either. How about this? Nope, that's really not healthy either. And it may be, you know, in terms of being fire prone, yes, it's not very fire prone and that's great, but that's just one criteria. What you have is one species of plant here. I think it's ponderosa pine. You have no understory. Um, this is not really a healthy forest either. But something more like this, where, where you do have something, if you had this, then you see a legacy tree like this, you might come through and, and just get rid of a little bit of this right around the tree so that that tree would survive a wildfire. You might um, actually just leave this the way it is. This, is. this is a healthy forest. Or where you have mixed oak and conifers, like a lot of us live in, actually most apparently in this uh, talk today. Then again, I would take a little bit of these bushes out from right around some of your bigger trees out there, your legacy trees, and maybe even a little bit right out of here so that they don't burn up if there is a fire. Because we live in California and California is fire adapted in most places, not the desert, but all, certainly El Dorado County is fire adapted. So it's, it's natural for fire to come out in there, those areas. You're not trying to protect them from any fire in the world, but you would like them to be um, you know, healthy. This would be more of a woke, an oak woodland, which I think a few of you lived in. And again, you can even have some dead material out there. That's okay out there. You don't want tons of dead material, but some snags are really important for wildlife and some downed logs are really important for the soil and fungus. And chaparral. You know, some people may look at this and just think, man, what a fire trap. But if it's away from homes, this is a natural chaparral community. And, Although it's fire adapted, it's not actually adapted to very frequent fires. So if you think about it, or maybe you don't know this, but um, beyond the 100 feet is kind of like um, where you want things to be the way they had been. For millennia, for thousands of years, the indigenous people were doing um, cultural burns and keeping these areas in kind of a constant, regular, but infrequent, um, or, or frequent, depending on where, where they were, fire regime. And so that's kind of what you're thinking of. You want to kind of mimic that. It's hard for us to imagine what that'd be like, but so if there's lots and lots of understory and it's really thick, that's not what you want. But you kind of think, well, what would this have looked like if there had been one of those surface fires a couple of years ago? And so if there's really dense vegetation that you want to get rid of, then you could do that. So just kind of think of that. And we've been trying to, especially just in the last couple of years, a lot of um, more interest in doing prescribed burns as the indigenous people have done and are doing in parts of California still and trying to bring that to other areas. And this isn't just for grasslands, this is also for forests. Like I said, this is that same picture we saw before where the fellows starting the fire in the left. And if this is something you're interested in doing, you know, not necessarily in your defensible space, but out in that area beyond you, if you're on a lot of property, you, and it doesn't even need to be all that much property. People are doing this, I think on five and 15 acres, but you definitely need to know what you're doing and you want to attend some training. There's a kind of a neat five session free webinar that's available right now online. Um, through Mariposa County. I think they have a new one coming up in May, but even so you can watch older versions of this. The sessions are free. And it also talks, you learn about neighborhood prescribed burn associations where a whole neighborhood can get together for one of these prescribed burns. And it talks about getting equipped funds through the, um, the Resource Conservation Service. So let's just look then back to our defensible space, some of the nuts and bolts. And specifically, let's look at seasonality. You know, when, when is it a good time to do some of these things and some of the basics of pruning? Because now we're, we're moving back into our defensible space now. So this is just kind of a guideline um, as the year goes round. In the winter, this, is, this talk is actually usually given at the end of January, which is a great time to be doing defensible space. We're just kind of getting out of that now as we move into March. But, Th these are all the wonderful winter activities you can do in those sunny days. Cut down trees that you need to cut down. Those would be the ones that are either dead or that really are just too close or right underneath another tree. Thinning and pruning the trees and the ornamental shrubs. 
great time to limb up your trees. It's also a good time to move plants and we'll talk about moving plants in, in a second, but um, you don't necessarily have to take out every plant. Some of them you can move. For the dead branches and plants, you really can do that any time of the year. Mowing though, because mowers have a metal blade, you don't want to get too far into summer and use those because the chances of sparks are too big. Of course, you can go through and get rid of the uh, rocks, which helps. But really doing that earlier in the spring is a better thing if you're mowing. If you're weeding, and especially with a string, trainer, string trimmer, you can go further into summer to get rid of some of those um, high dry weeds. Again, timing is everything on those so that you don't get seed set for next year. Some native shrubs, quite a few native shrubs that are uh, evergreen are actually kind of dormant in the summer, not the winter. And so they, this is actually a good time to thin and prune native shrubs. And then in terms of planting natives, if you now have room for something and you wanna add them or perennials or wildfire flower seeding, those are all done well in uh, kind of early winter or the end of fall. So this is just kind of a guideline though. If like say you're in here over here in April and there's you know, a tree you really want to get rid of, it doesn't say you can't cut it down then, but just remember because you're using a chainsaw, there's the chance of sparks and you don't want to start a fire. Things are starting to get dry enough in April, you have to start worrying about that. So it's just kind of a, a guideline to help you think about that. And one thing it really says like is that, you know, winter is a great time to be doing your defensible space stuff. One thing I also want to add was another reason why spring isn't necessarily a great time is because the birds are coming back and they're making nests. So if you are going to do some limbing up of trees or cutting down of trees or pruning, look really carefully first and make sure you're not disturbing some uh, bird nest with its babies. Just reminding you that um, any, any um, electric equipment can spark a fire and set things going. So you really want to get all this done well before things are too dried out. For pruning, um, you, just a few, just super basics. There are some classes through Master Gardeners specifically on pruning, but there's a collar that you want to be just above that collar, ideally when you're doing your pruning. And that way, because you know, taking things off of trees is, is not really easy on them. So you want to reduce the stress as much as possible. And this collar is where it will then heal over. If you're doing a big branch and you just go straight up there and try to cut it with like one of those pole saws, there's a good chance that it will fall and then you know peel away all the bark underneath and that's really hard on the tree. So what you wanna do is a first cut that's underneath. Say, say this is really where you want your, this is the collar. So you start further out from the collar, you make a little cut from the underside and you come to the top and you make a cut all the way through. Now you've got this funny little stub there which you don't wanna leave. So now you come back in there when it's just a, a little bit there and now you can cut all the way through and that little stub will cut off. Again, right above that branch collar. And this, you do the same thing for a dead branch. So all of this has been focusing on removal. I think of that as negative gardening. You know, gardeners don't always remove things but that's basically what we've been talking about. Um, just remember the plants can be moved and I've done, done actually quite a bit of that. It's hard, but it's definitely possible. We've moved a six foot kumquat, an eight foot lilac, um, a California rose, all successfully. This year, we finally got the last two plants that were within five feet of our house, which were two camellias. And I had a strong relationship to these two plants, even though they weren't native and not really helping the insects much or the pollinators. So we moved them. One was five feet high. I, it had been eight feet high, but I've been slowly lowering it. And I finally realized, okay, a camellia is not particularly fireproof, but it's within that five feet and anything will burn. So we had to move it. So we moved it last fall. And one of the two is doing really well and the other one not so well, although it hasn't died yet, we still hope that it might uh, make it. Um, anyway, if you're gonna do that, um, especially if it's a really special plant to you, you can shovel prune the roots in late fall. And then before it actually buds out, you wanna move it. Although again, camellias are a little different. It turns out we maybe should have done that a little bit later, but most bushes are this way or, or well, you're not really gonna move a tree. So you're gonna wrap the ball, the root ball with burlap to keep it nice and damp while you're moving it and get of course as much of the root as you can. Even We only got like, a, you know, a foot and a half at the most of the root. Um, and then when you put it in this new spot, you know, outside, maybe 75 feet out, 100 feet out, whatever, orient in the same direction to the sun if you can and keep the hole the same depth, but it can be wider and it can work. And then when you're planting your new plants, 
don't forget about defensible space. It's not just for, you know, the wild plants that are around you. So you want to be fire smart. You know, it's again, it's naturally we go to, oh, there's a wall. Let's put a plant right in front of it. Nope. Make sure you're at least five feet out. Look at what else is around. Think about how big that plant is going to be and make sure you plan for when it's at full size so you don't end up having to take it out, you know, eight years later. And is it fire prone? And we'll talk about that in a second, how you figure that out. Because take a look at this house. They've got some nice spaced plants, um, but there's two couple things wrong here. One is those little plants are going to grow. And in fact, this is gonna be a massive bed of juniper soon. And so basically what they've done, is they've put a whole bunch of little green gas cans in their front yard. Because as, you're, as some plants really are more fire prone. And so when you make your choices of what plants to put in and, and also which ones to take out as you're out there thinning, you kind of need to make wise plant choices based on flammability because some plants are really are more fire prone. And so let's take a look at these um, Italian cypress that are uh, popular and you can get these at some of the big box stores around here. Um, here's a fire, I think this is over in the Napa area and that's just getting going. And within just seconds, it was just expanded like this. It was right next to a house, a fire, company came in and sure that's what was underneath there were these Italian cypress which then started the house on fire and notice that none of the other vegetation around well this burned a little bit over here and this did but um, that was one hot fire and so the radiant heat from vegetation like that can then start a house burning just from that radiant heat so you don't want a lot of those flammable plants in your landscape within that 100 feet um, especially closer and closer to the house, you don't want them. So they tend to have lots of brittle and dead undergrowth. In fact, if you look here, this is the a juniper at the senior center here in Placerville. And when I, I was waiting for my COVID shot, <laughs> and so I opened it up and looked inside and there's this deep, deep, deep bed of brown dead stuff. And this is why part of why junipers are so dangerous, but they also have the other two things that are indicative of flannel plants. They have resinous leaves and they are aromatic, so all those things, but looking into your plants that you think are nice and green, and then you look inside, this is the same thing with baccarus. We have some um, coyote bush, which is a native plant, and it looks fine on the outside, but then when you get inside, you realize, wow, there's a lot of dead stuff inside of there. And that, you just think of an ember falling in there and all that nice fine fuel, and you've got yourself um, a problem. Others, there's panacetum. These are ones that are flammable again, particularly flammable. The pampas grass is an invasive anyway, so hopefully you don't have that one in your yard, but these are, are very flammable. Rosemary, unfortunately, is a very flammable plant. We had some of that in our yard. And again, removal is one thing, but also you can also just make it a lot smaller. We took out about three quarters of it and we still have a nice little clump of rosemary. Toyon. Toyon can be hazardous, uh, but if you keep that dead stuff cut out, because it tends to accumulate dead stuff, you can actually make a, a very nice plant out of it, but you have to really watch that dead stuff. And also I have heard that, not heard, I've read that with toyons, it's one of those plants that you can actually water and make it more resilient. Some natives, if you water them like a manzanita, you'll just kill it. But toyon is one that you can water and, and it uh, will be more resilient to fire. And people always want lists. They want lists, well, what can I plant? What's safe? There's a lot of problems with lists. They have contradictions. You can find one list that says one plant is flammable and you can find that exact same plant on another list and it says it's resistant. It's just people's opinions and nothing is fire resist, uh, excuse me, nothing is fire proof. It's only fire resistant. And so even if you see something on a list that says fire resistant, it doesn't mean that it's a totally safe plant. What really matters are irrigation and maintenance, especially maintenance. You know, what is the condition of that plant? Um, and that's really what's more important. So let's take a look at that an example of that. Here's, here's manzanita. So you think of manzanita, it's a fire hazard, right? So yeah, if we look here at all those manzanita, this is what manzanita does. It makes these massive batches of manzanita with lots of dead stuff, and that is a fire hazard. Um, again, it's okay if it's out beyond 100 feet, but if it's in your defensible space, that's not okay. On the other hand, here's a manzanita. This one is 30 years old. It's on our property. It's within 100 feet. We don't do anything to this tree, this, this manzanita. It's under an, a black oak. 
And it looked exactly like that for the 35 years we've been here. So if you see a manzanita on one list and it says a fire hazard, this manzanita is clearly not a fire hazard. It's not like it's gonna spontaneously combust just because it's a manzanita. They actually have fairly moderate um, fire bursting, <laughs> fire ignition. Or how about these manzanita though? Well, now you've got some manzanitas underneath some other manzanitas. And so there being a fire ladder into those, this is definitely a fire hazard. This is a major fire hazard. On the other hand, maybe this is one of those few manzanitas that's kind of a cultivar that you can water. And maybe there's, so there's just so much that goes into it. So the species is not what's important. Here's another example. Here we have the native form of coyote bush or baccarus. And um, it gets lots of, Dead wood, it's definitely a fire hazard. Um, it's one of those ones that if I had it within my defensible space, in fact, we did a tall one, we moved it out. It's backwards, actually, the bigger ones are a plant you can move pretty well. But there's also a dwarf form. And here's the dwarf form. This was actually in our front yard. And that was still definitely a fire hazard. It, it tends to get a lot of dead material in it like this. But then once we did some maintenance and got rid of all that dead material, and actually Baccarus is one of these ones that you can cut almost to the ground and it'll just come back with fresh new growth. So it wasn't, it's not the species, it's how you're maintaining it and how it's put in there. So that's why lists are a problem. And kind of old school was, oh, you want fire resistant? Get a lawn. But again, there's so much more into what we choose for our landscapes and just fireproofness and a lawn you have to do all kinds of mowing and pesticides and fertilizer and it's kind of a wildlife desert it's not doing any good for the the native wildlife in your area or the pollinators so it's not really something you necessarily want to have in your yard just to be fire resistant now we talked about some of the characteristics of plants that are flammable let's look at some of the characteristics of ones that are fire resistant they tend to be deciduous not always but usually they have kind of an open growth structure like you see here in this red bud they naturally hold moisture and they tend to be low growing so this red bud you know will get to be about 10 feet but it won't get huge and massive and just to remind you that it is something you can do you you can have a, a landscape that is fire wise and is also good for the pollinators, good for native insects and your entire you know, ecosystem that you're living in. And it could also be low water use. You can have drought resistant plants that fit in a fire wise landscape. This is just a reminder of why native plants in particular can be really useful in a landscape for their um, habitat value. This was a, um, we planted a little milkweed, which of course monarchs have to have. And sure enough, within a month, we had this little monarch caterpillar. You have no idea how excited I was. But by encouraging and planting native plants for all the larvae, and then you get all the birds, and then you get all the things that eat them, you can have a whole healthy ecosystem. And milkweed is one of those plants that tends to hold moisture. Here's another example of some of the native insects that you can enhance with your native plants. For this one, there's another butterfly that has to have this particular native plant. This is the pipevine, um, the Dutchman's pipevine, and then the pipevine swallow tail. And this is another plant that likes water. And so this is a plant that, you know, sometimes I don't like to water my plants, but if it's near my house, then I'm okay with watering because it's helping it make, keep it uh, more fire resilient. We talked about the red, but here's another great one is the Sonoma sage. This is a native sage in our county and it stays very low, which is really nice because you never have to prune it or anything. It just kind of slowly spreads along the ground. If it gets too big, for, uh, and then you can make the patch a little smaller. Edibles are a great thing to plant in your defensible space because you have to water them anyway. So why not put them in your defensible space? And don't forget to fit, um, Edible trees, there's a fig tree out here that can be okay in your defensible space, although that can be a problem if you're somewhere where it can become invasive. And don't forget wildflowers and other perennials, you know, little bushes of, of flowers are, tend to be less uh, fire prone. Plants that grow in the shade can be really nice. This is a, the native wild ginger because plants in the shade in general tend to be, have more moisture in them. Here's another one, the woodland strawberry. 
or riparian plants. You can take plants that usually are in riparian areas and have them in your landscape if you give them plenty of water. And again, normally I don't like to honestly water anything that, other than something that I can eat, but um, it is a, a place in your fire, pro, in your fire uh, resilient landscape. One of the absolute all-stars are oaks because they don't take any water, any additional water. They are absolute superstars for the wildlife. If you have them, treasure them. If you don't have them, consider planting an acorn. What will happen is it will grow up and underneath it, you will not get invasives because a lot of the invasives need sunlight. So um, it's just a, an incredible plant and they are very fairly fire resilient. They naturally limb themselves up. So you don't usually have to do any limbing yourself. And they find that they make the whole area under them more humid and less fire um, prone. So oaks are just a superstar. If you're kind of wondering about what you might want to put in your area or some of the plants that are already there, um, you can go to Calscape and actually put in your address here and then ask it, you know, these various things. Say you want to look at perennials and you click on perennials and then maybe you want to look at this particular plant. You look at blue-eyed grass. Oh, first I had to change. It goes to California. I have to put my address in again, put my address back in. Um, and it'll give you information. And often that information will include whether it's fire resistant or fire prone. Not always though. Um, it'll also show you the range of the plant. And so if there's a plant in your yard and you're kind of wondering about it, well, is this one I want to get rid of or should I get rid of this other one? You can use this to kind of make those decisions. There's another wonderful list, which uh, Ray Griffith, who is a horticultural professor over at Folsom Lake College created and has let, the, let people put online and use. There's a good version of it on the El Dorado CNPS, which is California Native Plant Society um, website. And so you can see how you, for the, all these plants that are in our county, this is specific to our county, it'll tell you not only it's fire resistance or fire proneness, but also whether it's drought resistant, whether the deer like it, what it's like for shade and its wildlife value. So this is a wonderful resource. So just remember, there are these few lists and there are other lists and I think we have some of them on our earlier handout, but no plant is fireproof and uh, Marin County, for example, had a, a list that lots of people are using and they're in the process of revising it now because it's just really hard to make these lists. <laughs> so let's do something now. Let's get more strategic. Let's evaluate your house. Um, we've been, everything we've been talking about so far has been very general for um, for creating defensible space. What we wanna do now is get more specific. So what are the direction of our biggest dangers? The fire behavior depends on terrain, wind weather, and vegetation. Those three things that kind of depend or influence how fire will behave. So if your house is closer than 30 to 100 feet from a stope, uh, steep slope, you're at bigger risk of having that wall of flames come up and, and um, impact your house. Now, if it's fairly, if this is real steep, that's where the 100 foot comes into effect. And if it's not particularly steep, then just 30 feet. So if you're back 30 feet and it's not very steep, you're fine. If this is real steep, then you probably, if you're not within, at least, you know, more like this house back here at 100 feet, then you're kind of in danger here. So that's one thing to look at is your terrain, but not just how far you are from a slope. Also, you want to know whether there are any chimneys there or box canyons or, you know, where's that slope coming from? Is it coming from a big, deep canyon like Weber Creek Canyon or South Fork American River Canyon? Is it a smaller canyon that's actually boxed in? And so that's a hazard. Is it, like I say, a chimney that's kind of coming up? Do you have a gulch there that's coming up? Um, might you be on a saddle where there's a, a hill not only on this side, but also on this side too. Then so you've got, you could have fire coming at you from both sides. So you really wanna look at your terrain and think about that. Usually what's happening above you is nowhere near as important as what's happening below you because fire travels uphill. And so you wanna look at what, what is below you. And what about the wind and the weather? Well, first off, which is your south or very simple, which is your south or your west side? Because it's probably the driest and what's gonna happen, the plants there tend to be drier, your house tends to be drier. So know, you know, be sure you know where your south and west side is because that again is your bigger vulnerability. 
but also you might want to know which direction is the prevailing wind. Maybe you have a sense for that because you've lived there a long time. You know, oh yeah, the wind always comes from this way. Or there is a website on the resources at the end, I forget what it's called, but where you can go and there's a really cool little diagram of the wind that comes through. Um, for example, here's, here's some wind coming into the Oak Hill area, but here's Placerville, here's Diamond Springs, here's Outingdale. So really it's this whole South County and Placerville area. You can see how the wind is mostly coming from the Southwest. So that might be the area of your biggest danger, but don't forget that any big fire is gonna have its own wind pattern too. So even though this might be kind of a guide, you know, where embers might be coming from, which direction, just remember that in a big fire, it can be completely different and can be all over the place. So we talked about the terrain. We talked about the wind and the weather. The third one that matters for fire behavior is the fuel. Okay, well, we're gonna assume you've created your defensible space. Well, how close are other houses? Because that's fuel too, and maybe fuel you don't have any connection to. Um, are they 25 to 30 feet away? Because if they are, the radiant heat from those can cause your house to burn. So you really have to think about that maybe on, on your, you know, your, your west side, not only is it drier, but you also have a house there within 25 feet. Well, then that's the side of your house that you really want to concentrate on both for your defensible space, maybe being a little more aggressive and maybe even hardening your house on that side. What about your outbuildings, chicken coops, anything within 25, 30 feet. And uh, the reason I say 25 to 30 is because some places you see 30, some places you see 25, so it's somewhere in there. Um, if it's a small thing like a chicken coop, then it's probably not gonna have as much of effect, but it still can if it's within that area. If it's a big barn or a big garage or something or a big shed, you know, that's again, can have significant effect on that side of your house. So what we're gonna do now is I'd like you to take that paper and your pencil, and we're gonna do a quick little activity. Um, so I'm going to give you just a chance to get that ready <clears throat> and for me to take a drink of water. Okay, so on your piece of paper, go ahead and right in the middle of it, draw your house it, and not, you know, just a, it could just be a cartoon house. Just draw your house for reference right in the middle. Okay, now next, if you know it, Go ahead and you know down below your house, put where or, or wherever it is, put your south side of your house, if you know it, and circle that. If you don't know it, that's okay. And maybe you put your west side of your house on also. Okay, next I want you to look at your, think about your slope. Think about what is down slope of your house and put an arrow from your house going down that slope. So you know which side of your house has the down slope to it. And if it's on a couple of sides, then go ahead and put it on all those sides, your arrow going down. Okay. Then if you're in one of those danger areas we talked about where if you're on a saddle or if you have a gulch on that side, or if there's some other danger area, then just go ahead and star those arrows to show that they're kind of special that and maybe even right in gulch or canyon if you're near a canyon. And this can even be half a mile away also for this part, because if you know that you're you know, well aware from a, a canyon, but there is a canyon in that direction, you might want to on that direction of your house, because again, that's where embers might be coming from. So go ahead and on that side of your house, um, go ahead and start and put you know, canyon or whatever. Okay, next would be a prevailing wind. If you know, if you kind of have a sense for where your wind usually comes from, go ahead and put it on there with a dashed line going towards your house, because again, that might be bringing embers. If you don't know where it is, then maybe eventually you can add that to your little diagram after looking at the um, website on the resource that we'll give you. Okay, and then next, think about your neighbor, which side they're on, and if they're greater than 30 feet away, don't put them on, that's fine. Um, although I suppose the embers could come from that side. But um, if you do have any little buildings, any little sheds or chicken coops or anything like that, go ahead and put those on the side of, that, of your house, on the correct side. Okay, so we've made this kind of brief little model here. Go ahead and shade in then the sides of your house, right next to your house, that are towards those danger areas, that are ones that are above the slope, that are ones where the prevailing winds are hitting, 
the ones where you might have some buildings next to them, shade in all the area, the sides of your house that might have some extra danger. Okay, so those sides of the house are the ones where you really want to first concentrate maybe your defensible space being more aggressive and then also think about hardening your home. And one more thing I wanted you to think about uh, in the danger of your own house, house is this is a, again a map of El Dorado County. And again, I think this must be Placerville here. Yeah, 49. Um, and so Pollock Pines is up, I think about in this area and El Dorado Hills is down about here just to orient you. And what this is showing is fire history from actually before 1950 all the way up until 1990. So it doesn't include up until 2020, but um, so it doesn't have the, does it have the King Fire on it? I don't think so. No, it doesn't have the King Fire on it. So um, what, what's interesting about this is you see certain areas like this one where there's fire on top of fire, on top of fire, on top of fire. The different shadings are the different time periods as you see here. You have the four 1950, 1950 to 1969, 1970. To, so these are different time periods. So you can see how they've had lots of fires right on top of each other in this area. If you live in this area, this is actually a higher risk area. You might think, oh, well, this is a higher risk area over here where there's no fires because they never haven't had their fire yet. But in reality, fires they find with studies tend to come in the same places over and over. And that probably has to do with terrain and wind direction and things like that. And the campfire, for example, up in Paradise and Megalia, it's another one of these that you look on one of these maps and there's just fire on top of fire or on top of fire. So if you're in this area here, or in this area up here, which is actually a little above Pollock Pines, although if we put in the campfire, I mean, the King Fire, it might be Pollock Pines too. Or if you're out in this area, or maybe out in this area, you might just star your house to remind yourself that you are in a higher risk area for wildfire. So again, once you put that on, and it just kind of gives you thought. So again, keep this in mind when you're planning your defensible space and when you're um, trying to prioritize what you're going to do when. And then the next thing you'll do, and you won't do this right now, but you'll do this afterwards sometime, is I want you to think like an ember and walk around your house. And you're gonna look and see where an ember can hit something combustible. And what can be really good is after a big windstorm, like in the fall, Go ahead and walk around and take pictures actually, because if you're like me, you forget. You think, I think leaves were there, but I can't really remember. I, oh, I did this, um, actually it was two years ago. I went around and took these photos of where leaves were collecting because not only will leaves collect there, but it, they also say that's likely where the embers might collect too during a fire. And so like, for example, this is my house and here we have six inches of foundation like we're supposed to. And so it's not really too much of a hazard having these leaves here. Look over here where these leaves are, and sometimes we do get big piles over here. For some reason, this part of our house doesn't have that little six inch buffer. And so this can easily start our house on fire. And so this is an era where we actually replaced the siding and did some strategic hardening of our house. We're not necessarily going to replace the siding on our whole house, but we realized that that was an era of real vulnerability for us. And so you can do the same thing at your house and just, again, walk around your house and, and look for things that might be a, a particular hazard. Um, again, we are doing some retrofits on our home on the areas that we felt were the um, towards the biggest danger. And then just to do a quick before and after here, this is um, our front yard. And this was really hard because every one of these plants I had planted and nursed for its through its first summer with, you know, um, weekly waterings by hand. They were now established, totally drought resistant. But this is not a fire safe landscape. And so this was in our defensible space. You, you can see the house is right over here. And so we needed to change it and it was really hard. And so this is what it looks like today. We cut about three quarters of our rosemary out. This is a backers field, which now has, we've taken out about every other plant there. Um, we've cut our lavender way down and back. It's a little deceptive because these trees are still deciduous in this picture. I just took this yesterday, but um, you can see how we made quite a change in our defensible space. We also took out, there was a whole rosemary bush over here I took out. There was a San Luino over here that was right underneath this flannel bush. I took that out. And so you might say, I don't wanna remove plants or trees, I love them. And it's hard. Um, plants are really valuable. They provide shade in the summer. You know, they're habitat for wildlife, especially if you planted lots of natives. 
They're giving you privacy, maybe from your neighbors. They're aesthetically pleasing. Nature's good for you, right? It's good for your home value. You're preventing erosion with those plants. You're protecting water quality. It can prevent invasives when you have a lot close to each other. It sequesters carbon. All these are great things. But a big giant wildflower fire is not a great thing. It's not good for the ecosystem you live in. It's not good for you. It's not good for your house. And so you can, sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and do it. We're gonna look at just a quick, a couple of quick examples now. If you look at this house, let's, let's think about their vulnerabilities. Okay, so they've got some of these evergreen um, flammable plants right underneath their windows. These guys too over here, they've got this tree overhanging their house. They've got this big patch of bushes right in front of their house too. And it's kind of flat here. This area up here probably isn't as big of a hazard because it's the upslope. But down here, they right along their road, they have some things. Let's see what they're going to do now. Okay, so they cleared out some of their road. They put a patio in here instead of all those, those um, flammable bushes right here. They went ahead and just cut these down thinking that might be good enough. They took out, they thinned out these bushes here. Um, they left these here because those were perfectly fine. But what else do you see here now? What might they do next? They probably should take out these that are a little further out, but they're being ladder fuel to that oak. They probably should trim up their oaks a little. This chaparral that's coming right down towards them, they might want to remove some of these plants and make it not quite as much. They don't need to take out this patch here, maybe. They might want to take out this bush here because it's right along the road, and they probably should trim that tree back further. Oh, and also they just took that out all the way, which is good. They had, Before they'd cut them down, now they've got them out completely. So now they've turned it into this. So it's not radically different, but it's different enough to be much, much more fire um, resilient. And again, their 100 foot was right about out here. They took out four trees here, but otherwise the rest, this is just uh, you know natural oak woodland out here beyond their 100 feet. That's what it was. And then just to try it, we made a little model of a house <laughs> to see if we could do some of these um, principles to help you see this too. Um, so here we have a little house with a deck and it's got some bushes right under the deck. It's got wood piled here. I think I can go closer. Yeah, here we go. And see the wood piled here. This is its recycling bin right on the deck. This tree that's overhanging it. Some bushes right next to the, the walls as here. And again, that pine. And if we look at the 30 feet, well, first of all, those are all five foot things. We wanna get rid of those bushes, get rid of all this, get rid of the wood, put it somewhere else, get rid of these bushes. Then when you go out to 30 feet, which is this line, you're gonna maybe wanna move that shed actually out. You're gonna to wanna to make sure this wood, these wood mulch um, stays out there. And because this is pine, you probably don't want this pine needle bolt mulch anywhere in here at all. And you certainly wanna do something about the overhanging tree. So we did all those things. So you can see how this is now totally clear around the five feet. There's nothing there that's combustible except for the deck. We even took the recycling off. The wood pile has been moved out here for the 30 feet. Um, we went ahead and left this mulch in because it's wood chips, but we took out the pine completely. We moved the shed out a little bit. We thinned some of these, we, and we actually moved one of those plants out here. Then if you look out here at the 100 foot, what you might do, uh, what it's pretty, pretty dense over here, so they might do something over here. These are actually some plant, this is a pretty big, this is too big here. This is almost a 30 foot big clump of shrubs. So then in deciding which ones to get rid of, maybe we decide to get rid of these two that aren't native and aren't necessarily helping the wildlife since I have to get rid of something. And this bush though is just unfortunately going right between these bushes and these ones back here. So maybe I'm gonna get rid of that too. And so we're starting to look like that. And then there's is the cedar that's right in, I forgot to mention, this is a gulch coming up towards their house here. So a big cedar tree right there. You probably don't want it right in the gulch, but you might want to keep some of these bushes because it's helping with erosion in this, um, this area. And so here it is again, we're more thinned out here now, less stuff here within the hundred feet now. So maybe that defensible space would look something like that. And then out here, we would just leave it be. In fact, here's a dead, a dead snag out here beyond the hundred feet. So does this stuff work? This house survived the campfire. 18,800 and something didn't, and this house did. It had been recently upgraded for its roofs and its vents, so the harm hardening part, and it also had no plants next to the house. It had good defensible space. 
let's say you live in this house over here though, and you've done all this great defensible space work. Alice, and you're, yes? Alice I'm gonna stop you. It looks like your slides are not advancing forward. Oh. We still see the, the I think first slide with the little white house. Thank you, hang on. So it says right here that the screen is paused. I must have accidentally paused it. Which one do you think I pushed without losing it? I don't try that one. I, guess, I don't know. You might have to unshare. And... I'm going to stop share for just a second and come back. Thank you. Just uh, uh, for some reason it's paused and I can't seem to unpause it. Oh, did that work? It's not screen sharing yet. Okay. We can see your slides. Okay. So was this where it was? The greenhouse, yes. We we missed the last slide that showed your defensible space, but I think you walked us through it really well. Okay, great. So the question was, does this stuff work? And again, you already, I did talk to you about all the things that they had done. And so this one was one that survived. And so what I was saying was that if you lived in this house and you'd done everything right, but you next door neighbor had all of this stuff right in front of their house, you know, what, what do you do? What, um, your house is at tremendous danger because the radiant heat from this house, if it catches on fire, is gonna burn up your house. So what you do is you get together with your neighbors for various things, you know, we can all work together. It can make a huge difference. This is a group that got together to clear off their road. They rented this chipper. They did a wonderful work over there on a, a road in the Oak Hill area. And you, you can do this in terms of, um, you know, education for people, making second roads, clearing roads, prescribed burns, all this kind of stuff, just education so that other people around you know about the dangers of fire. There's another wonderful case, but I'm losing time, so I won't tell you their story. And then there are fire safe councils throughout our county. There's actually about 25 or 26 of them. So not the whole county, but if you live in one of these fire safe councils, you know, you can get wonderful education from them and you can connect with them. And as a community, you can work together to make your community safer. The future, we started out with risk. Risk is only getting worse. There's more built up fuel out there. There's more people. And with more people comes more infrastructure, more electric lines that can fail, more people who can set sparks with their, um, with their equipment. And then climate change is affecting things. And models are suggesting that our wildfire seasons are gonna be longer, that the vegetation is gonna be even drier, partly because there's gonna be these extreme events they think with droughts. Models are showing that the wildfires will be more intense or excuse me, more of the wildfires will be intense and there will be more damaging. So with all this, we can work to mitigate and adapt to all these for the built up fuel. We can reduce our fuels through landscape work like we've been talking about and prescribe burns for more people. We can improve our electric infrastructure and also do lots of education about wildfire like the fire safe counselors are doing. And for climate change, we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to try to reduce some of those um, extreme events in the future. We don't fight earthquakes, tornadoes, or hurricanes. We adapt and build smarter, don't we? So living here in the wildland urban interface, we do have some responsibility to protect our homes and our communities, not just the ones that we've built, but also the natural ones around us. Remember, it's not any one thing, it's a system of things all together, all three of those, the hardening the home, the defensible space, the access road. And it can be really hard work. You know, and if you get together with other people, it makes it a little easier, but there's no way around that creating defensible space is hard. But this is hard work too. I'll let you read the last one, two slides. And one more thing I just want to mention as I, I close out here, you know, with rain, we think of rain as a beautiful thing that brings life, but think about how rain also can be incredibly damaging with its floods. It can kill people, it can ruin homes and things too. In fact, in California, there's more damage from floods than there is from fire. And yet when we think about 
when we think about fire, we think very damaging, very negative thoughts, but really it brings life also. It makes many wildfires, uh, wild flowers bloom like crazy. We have these super blooms that can happen. It um, enhances the soil with the biochar. Fire is a part of our state and where we live and we just need to learn to live with it and adapt to it and save our homes and our communities. Don't be afraid, be ready. So these are the last things to remember. Evaluate your own yard and your house, make a plan. Prioritize doing the most important things first. Keep going, don't stop just because you started. You know, it doesn't mean you have to do this every day, but maybe you know, the first year even you'll do these three things and the next year you'll do something else. But it, by all means maintain in the future. So thank you very much. We live in a beautiful place. Let's keep it that way. All right, now, if there's any questions, and I'm sorry that um, I went right to the end, and but I will definitely stay here for any questions that anyone might have. And Pam has been monitoring the chat box. And so Pam, were there any questions you wanted to ask? There are a couple of questions. I would like to tell everybody that we're at the end of our um, class. And if you wanna log off, go ahead and log off. If you wanna stay for questions, then stay for questions. Um, can you hear me, Alice? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark Stanley and um, Kit Veerkamp and Karen for helping with all to answer the questions. So a lot of the questions have already been answered. Wonderful. Um, Wonderful. Yes, I know. So the one question, well, there's a couple. One is, may we have a definition or description of mineral soil? Oh, good question. Um, so basically not duff. You don't wanna go down to duff because duff can burn. And, and so anything that has a high organic content in it would not be mineral soil. Mineral soil means down to um, you know, sandy stuff or the, the rock particles of dirt without a lot of organics in it, if that helps. Okay. So, so not duff. Right, okay. So it's like down to the bare, down. down to bare, yeah, bare dirt, which you'd call bare dirt, that's good. Okay, there we go. Um, um, are there any government programs to help with the cost of removing trees from private property? Um, let's see, there are, and Mark, are you able to answer that one better? There are some various grant possibilities. There, there are some, uh, what you, you have to have more acreage and be involved in a vegetation management program. So not for the small lander owner. Okay. So it's so it's for the larger yeah. landowners. Yeah. Okay. Um okay, I think this may have been answered, but do you have any guidance on dealing with connected canopies that are more than 30 feet from the structure? Should they be separated from each other? Hey, that's you can, a oh, go ahead. You can separate it if you want, if you can, but if you don't separate separate the canopy 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 uh, the you Canopy. need to limb up the uh, lower limbs and eliminate the ground fuel, the lighter fuels that, that the uh, <clears throat> fire doesn't go up in the trees and create a crown fire. Okay. And I think also the species can help a little bit too. If they're oaks, then they don't tend yeah. to burn as quickly as the conifers do, right? And so, yeah. and oaks are these big spreading things their canopies are going to touch. Okay. Um, and then I believe that Kit may have answered this, but there was a question about, do I remove or replace the wood deck? Oh, okay. So there's... You know, it's, they're really working hard on this because a lot of people, especially in the Sierra foothills have decks. And there are a number of different things that are possible. First, they were telling us, you know, oh, keep the spacing really big. And then other times they're saying, oh no, have a solid uh, cement-like 
top on it. There's, you can even, if it's right next to the house, you can even take out a board or two and have a spot along there. Um, I would go to the UCANR Hardening Homes. They have whole sections there on decks and read what they have to say and especially watch for the update of that that's coming. Um, I think that was, it's like building for wildfire mitigation. I, I think I've got the uh, link on one of the, the earlier resource. Okay. Um, so Anne has a question about how many acres does it take to qualify for government funded tree removals? That sounds like the same question about the- <laughs> I, I think it's not tree removal, it's, uh, in connection with a vegetation management program. They will do uh, a number of properties to bake a fuel break or so there is a place for the fire department to make a stand, but not just to remove trees. That's the land order's responsibility. Okay. All right. So, so removal of the trees is the landowner's responsibility. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I believe is. Are, does anybody have any other questions that they can put into chat? I, I have a bunch of things saying it's a great presentation and thanking you so much, Alice. But other than that, I think that we're done. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, anyone who's still on, I really appreciate your caring about this subject and um, in, enjoy your homes and your defensible space. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.